For anyone following the history of private launch vehicle developments, Rotary Rocket probably stands out among the rest. It's a strange looking system to say the least, with a unique design and interesting story. Let's learn about Rotary Rocket's Roton Launch Vehicle. A good place to start with Rotary Rocket is the single stage to orbit SSTO concept. An SSTO is a rocket that can take off and go to orbit without staging. Into those rockets you see in 50s sci-fi. Ideally, this rocket would also be capable of returning to the launch site to fly again. To, to avoid boring discussion on the engineering details, SSTO is uh, hard. Getting stage weights low and engine performance high enough requires creative thinking and clever engineering. Every gram counts on rockets. Even more so with SSTO. This, incidentally, is why half of SSTO designs are space planes. Why fight the atmosphere when you could use it to your advantage? Use jets or air-breathing engines for the lower atmosphere, then kick in the optimized rocket for the rest. Use an aero spike. For landing, have a lifting body so you don't need propellant to land, and instead, just glide on in. There's another type of aircraft available to us that can also take off and land, but like a rocket. Helicopters. Let me introduce you to Bevan C. McKinney and Gary C. Hudson. Bevan McKinney's original vision can be seen in this patent. The Roton would be a helicopter up to a certain altitude, then convert to a rocket. This is where the design gets interesting. Instead of a bog standard engine at the base, the rocket engines would be at the tips of the rotor. The rotor itself would act as a large turbo pump, using centrifugal force to increase engine chamber pressure and therefore performance. These tip jets would then carry the vehicle into orbit like a conventional rocket. A key benefit of this design was the ability to optimize the tip jets for a higher altitude performance rather than being closer to sea level. This flight path would also mean the rocket would experience less drag since it's above the denser parts of the atmosphere. Once in orbit, the payload is deployed and the Roton would deorbit itself. The vehicle's return is somewhat like a ballistic landing, except the helicopter rotor would auto-rotate and be used as a big drag brake. This would slow Roton down to hover and then land like a conventional helicopter. McKinney and Hudson teamed up to form a rotary rocket in 1996 and build this unique system. The two had worked together before on Hudson's Phoenix SSTO designs. Roton was under development when the small satellite market, the one it was intended for, collapsed. Instead of folding up, the company redesigned Roton for larger payloads. Here's where our first problem hits. A bigger payload meant a bigger rocket one which couldn't take off like a helicopter at the start. Instead, still keeping with centrifugal pumps, there would have been a carousel of 96 or so engines making an aeroplug to lift the rocket to orbit on a conventional ballistic trajectory. Landing would have been roughly the same as before. Helicopter blades would act as a drag surface during re-entry, then be spun with the tip jets to land. Except, according to pilot Joe Shelton, the carousel was too heavy and probably wouldn't have worked. A new engine was needed, though none was ever selected. Fast track was considered, but was found out to be too heavy as well. Rumor has it the NK-33 was a possible replacement. During this time, an atmospheric test vehicle was built by Burt Rutan for atmospheric testing of the vehicle and the tip jets. A big rollout happened on March 1st, 1999. Guests included novelist Tom Clancy, sci-fi author Jerry Purnell, Dr. Phil Chapman, an astronaut, and Max Hunter, a major SSTO proponent and engineer for the Thor missile program. Here's Hudson and his parents. Hmm. Maybe that's why they failed. The ATV would perform flight tests to demonstrate auto rotation and tip jet functions. During these tests, major technical problems arose. One was that the vehicle was nearly impossible to fly at points which is not necessarily a good idea for a crewed vehicle coming down from orbit. Another was that the tip jet exhaust would impinge on the rotors, hindering flight characteristics. Aside from technical issues, the company simply ran out of money. Rotary Rocket existed in the dot-com boom and bust. No one was interested in a five-year ROI when you could have gotten it in a month, according to Tom Brose, one of Roton's engineers. Plus, the MIO market, Iridium, Navistar, and Global Star, also collapsed at the same time. Rotary Rocket closed in 2000, with many of the team ending up at X-Core, building the Lynx spaceplane. 
Hudson, Bros, and others ended up working with Air Launch LLC. Presently, the ATV sits at the Mojave Air and Spaceport. A reminder to the other space companies there of what could happen to them. The original Roton's weight and performance figures are hard to ascertain. According to the patent, the dry mass was to be 3 to 15,000 pounds with a payload of a teledesic satellite. The later Roton aimed for 3,200 kilograms, 7,000 pounds, of payload to a 300 kilometer orbit at 50 degrees inclination, which this did include two crew and supplies for 72 hours on orbit. Roton was targeting Iridium class spacecraft, plus their kick stages. The gross liftoff weight was to be roughly 180 metric tons. Structurally, the vehicle was aiming for a 5% dry mass. The undetermined engine was to have a vacuum ISP of around 355 seconds, burning LOX kerosene. It was planned for the vehicle to be operated like a cargo aircraft, with minimal maintenance and quick turnaround between flights. Rumors have it the Roton was planned to also be a suborbital business jet. I know the question on all of your minds. Would this have worked? No. Not the version that was built, anyway. Aside from the fact that it was unflyable, there was no engine selected, meaning Rotary Rocket would have had to build their own engine at some point. The biggest issue was weight. Based on my own survey of LOX kerosene stages, the structural mass is bottom out at roughly 6% of the propellant carried, and those are expendable systems. 5% would have required a breakthrough structurally, especially since Roton was to be crewed. Using LOX kerosene, or Jet A jet fuel, was a potential mistake. The fuel is well understood, but other hydrocarbons might have performed better. Money is the showstopper here. According to Shelton, Rotary Rocket spent roughly $32 million by the time of the rollout. The company would have needed three to five times that for an actual flight vehicle and probably even more to develop their own engine. As for the original vision, uh, maybe. The key mistake with Rotary Rocket was abandoning the helicopter takeoff, which would have lowered performance requirements on the engine and structures. It's hard to say. Rotary Rocket is a strange dot on the roadmap of private space development, probably the last pre-new space design before the X Prize and the rise of SpaceX. It's a unique idea and system that probably wouldn't have worked. Roton. That's a rocket, you know.